back. Now that we've talked about neurons, glia, and neurotransmitters, it's time to talk about what happens when lots of neurons gather together and make the brain. So let's get to it. First thing first is to acknowledge that the average human brain includes as an estimated 100 billion neurons. So we just spent a lot of time focusing on what one neuron looks like. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. 100 billion neurons in this brain. On average, the brain represents about 2% of our body weight, but uses about 20% of our daily calories. And that's because the brain is a huge hog for oxygen and glucose. It's constantly using our sugar systems. Now we often spend a lot of time talking about gray matter and white matter. It's important to understand that the soma or the bodies of the neurons tend to look like gray matter and the axons, because we're wrapping that myelin sheath, tend to look like white matter. So we tend to say the outside of the brain is the gray matter and a lot of the inside gooey bits will be the white matter. So it's just something to keep in mind to hear white matter, gray matter. Now, when we're making a brain, because uh, we all made our own brains way back when, uh, how these neurons became connected is through the process known as synaptogenesis. Although there's 100 billion neurons here, uh, and, mo and almost all of them were there at birth, they weren't all connected. What we actually find is that in newborn human infants, there are some connections, but it's often poorly connected neurons in many areas of the brain. And so what happens is, uh, in this illustration, you can see in the leftmost panel, there are some, some dots, but there's not a lot of connections. We can see that representing the somas, uh, but there's not a lot of dendrite connections or terminal buttons, synaptic connections, if you will. And so uh, we do certainly have some areas that are connected, but within the first year of life, these neurons become so hyper-connected that when one neuron fires, it sends a signal to many other neurons. So when one neuron lights up, it lights up many and those many light up many more. And, and so what we find here is in infancy, uh, there's a lot more connections in the brain that babies have that children and adults do not have. Uh, some of the things we'll talk about uh, in the next unit, such things as uh, synesthesia, more common in infancy and young childhood than adulthood. And then we discovered that this hyperconnectedness of the center panel there is not efficient. And so our brain selectively prunes different synaptic pathways. That is, it discovers that a neuron doesn't need to talk to all other neurons. Uh, it only needs to talk to some other neurons. And so it'll prune uh, the pathways that are least efficient, only retaining the most efficient of pathways. So our brain can process information faster and more efficiency, for efficiently. And this represents the rightmost panel on the illustration. So this is the idea through synaptic pruning that our brain begins to communicate with itself much more effectively. So like synaptogenesis, we also undergo neurogenesis. And this is the idea that early on in our prenatal development, our brain does not originally look like this. Our brain starts off looking like a neural tube, if you will. And the neural tube is the basis of the brain, that is the brain stem. So at the top of our spinal cord, or what will become our spinal cord, is where new nerve cells begin to blossom out. And so they start to blossom out and get pushed upwards. So the top of the brain stem continues to produce new neurons, and it, it doesn't produce them at the top, it produces them at the bottom of our brain. So as the new neurons are produced at the bottom of our brain, at the bottom of the brain, at the bottom of the brain, it will constantly push those neurons up into sort of a, a blooming flower motion or a blooming mushroom, if you will. Um, and so they kind of go up, and I tend to think of it as like a little firework shooting off in the sky, and the different neurons find their own little spot um, through localization. And so it's the idea that the neurons that will eventually go into our frontal lobe or occipital lobe will find their way there. And so by the time we are uh, born, our brain has many different specialized regions. And you may see this, uh, the different regions broken down differently in different textbooks or different sources. So I have this diagram on the slide here to help you. Uh, often we talk about things such as the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, although there's not too much intro textbooks tend to say about the midbrain. Other ways people may break it down is uh, comparing different components of the forebrain. Uh, one of them is really talking about the cerebral hemispheres, and another component talking about um, more of the limbic system and the thalamus and hypothalamus. Uh, we may also see people talk about the hindbrain and different components, um, talking about the cerebellum separate from the pons and the medulla. So this is just some possibly different ways uh, that you can talk about things. 
I like noting that the thalamus and hypothalamus can be considered both the forebrain and the brainstem in different sources. So keep in mind, I would never test you uh, a question is the thalamus in the, in the brainstem or the forebrain, as this diagram is showing that different conceptualizations of the brain could break these down to different areas. Now what happens after birth, our brain continues to develop and we want that to happen. And most human brains start to uh, reach their peak maturation point around age 25. And so what happens in childhood and adolescence uh, is that these connections, the synapses between the neurons, uh, they are constantly being created and destroyed. And so what happens is we go through this synaptic pruning, not just in early infancy, we also go through it right before the onset of elementary school, so around age five. We also go through it uh, right before puberty, and we also go through it again in early adulthood, uh, somewhere between 18 and 24 years of age. And so what happens is we, we puberty is a good example. Uh, in late childhood, at the onset of adolescence, we tend to see rapid synaptogenesis, where things start to connect that were not connected before, and then we see the pruning and the pruning back. And so we see these different waves throughout uh, childhood and adolescence of thickening and thinning of our cortical uh, material, cortical tissue. And so what we find is that the cortical tissue here, especially in the cerebrum, it actually becomes measurably thicker and measurably thinner as we gain more connections between our neurons and as we prune the less efficient connections in our neurons. And so this, this is really fascinating. What this thickening and thinning tends to represent is that there's certain times in our life where it may be easier to gain new skills. So in infancy, when everything is really hyper-connected, it means if you want to learn a second language, for instance, it might be a good time to be exposed to that second language, but after the pruning, it might be a little bit difficult. And we find that uh, whether you're in early onset French immersion or late onset French immersion here in Canada, whether it starts in grade one or it starts in grade seven, uh, both those types of French immersion are much easier to learn a second language than if you try and pick up a second language in your 30s. Uh, and so one of the reasons for this is because after every round of thickening and thinning, that thinning is when they cut the pathways you're not using. It's very much a use it or lose it phenomena. And so if you've never played a musical instrument, uh, it's going to prune some more of some of the potentially musical areas or potential second language areas. Uh, and so this is one of the things that's really important to understand. Uh, and so many undergraduate students that are under the age of 25, it's a good time to think about what skills you want to develop um, and start to lay the groundwork of that so you don't lose those synapses and lose those connections before it's too late. Other little remarks we want to make about the brain before we go on uh, is that there is, uh, of course, what are these little grooves that I keep talking about when I, when I rub the cerebrum? Uh, well, we have the sulci and we have the gyri. And the sulci refers to the grooves, and the gyri is just the folds. So you can see in the diagram here um, that the sulci is really the grooves and the gyri is really the folds. All right, so now let's talk about different localized areas of the brain. The part I keep tapping and rubbing here, the exciting part that a lot of people want to find the most about is, of course, our cerebrum. And so our cerebrum is this, uh, it is the part full of silky and gyri, of course, and, and so this is the part that we can think about as broken up into different hemispheres. Uh, but what we have here is there is different uh, lobes. So we have what's called the frontal lobe. This is at the front of the head. This is what's right behind the forehead. We have the temporal lobe. This is kind of right above the ears. We have the parietal lobe, which is more on the top of the head, and we have the occipital lobe, which is on the back of the head. So these are the four lobes. And so now it's important to understand that these lobes um, are specialized, but are also generalized too. We're going to talk about the specialization of each of these lobes. It's important to understand that these lobes can um, compensate for other areas, and although they contain some primary cortexes, there's many secondary and tertiary cortexes that make this a lot more complicated. But let's go into the primary cortexes first.